I'm excited to uh, introduce Miriam O'Neill, who is a local poet. She has published. She has been involved here at the library with the poetry, The Art of the Word, which we've been doing on a monthly basis here. Recently, we had an art show. The Irish Art Show also has poetry next to it. It's called Inverse Poetry. And Miriam wrote one of the poems for one of the pieces. So I would love to bring you up to the podium, please. Miriam O'Neill. Hey, you guys. I've told some of you um, who I met earlier that I taught writing at the prison back when it was a little tiny jail. It used to be, ironically, right across from Plymouth North High School. You could leave one campus and go to the other. Um, and I taught poetry there and I taught uh, writing for college because there was a very strong education component on that campus. I don't know about Moot Prison, but they had a very strong education component and they really, um, the warden was intent on getting as many young men up and running and into college as possible. It was really great. I was glad to be part of it. And I understand that you guys have spent some time there, you know, with prisoners of writing, and doing some of your own writing, and that your theme has been the American experience. So I chose a few poems that I'd like to share with you. One of my own um, about the American experience of uh, growing up with a veteran of World War II. Does anybody have a grandparent that was a World War II veteran? Still alive? Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit older than you, so it was my dad. And I also wanted to share a poem with you. The first one I want to read is um, by an amazing poet who spent a lot of his adult life in prison. He was um, a heroin addict. And um, back then there, there weren't any programs. If you got high or if you um, got in trouble because of your addiction, you just went to prison. That's, that's what happened to you. No recovery programs, no halfway houses. You just went to prison. And um, his name was Etheridge Knight, and I'm going to read you a poem by him called and the, the Idea of Ancestry. Taped to the wall of my cell are 47 pictures, 47 black faces, my father, mother, grandmothers, one dead, grandfathers, both dead, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, first and second, nieces and nephews. They stare across the space at me, sprawling on my bunk. I know their dark eyes. They know mine. I know their style. They know mine. I am all of them. They are all of me. They are farmers. I am a thief. I am me. They are thee. I have at one time or another been in love with my mother, one grandmother, two sisters, two aunts. I went to the asylum, uh, one went to the asylum, and five cousins. I am now in love with a seven-year-old niece. She sends me letters written in large block print, and her picture is the only one that smiles at me. I have the same name as one grandfather, three cousins, three nephews, and one uncle. The uncle disappeared when he was 15, just took off and caught a freight, they say. He's discussed each year when the family has a reunion. He causes uneasiness in the clan. He is an empty space. My father's mother, who is 93 and who keeps the family Bible with everything, everybody's birth dates and death dates in it, always mentions him. There is no place in her Bible for whereabouts unknown. 
Each fall, the graves of my grandfathers call me. The brown hills and red gullies of Mississippi send out their electric messages, galvanizing my genes. Last year, like a salmon, quitting the cold ocean, leaping and bucking up his birth stream, I hitchhiked my way from LA with 16 caps in my pocket and a monkey on my back. And I almost kicked it with the kinfolk. I, excuse me, I walked barefooted in my mother's, grandmother's backyard. I smelled the old land and the woods. I sipped corn whiskey from fruit jars with the men. I flirted with the women. I had a ball till the caps ran out and my habit came down. That night, I looked at my grandmother and split. My guts were screaming for junk, but I was almost contented. I had almost caught up with me. The next day in Memphis, I cracked a croaker's crib for a fix. This year, there is a gray stone wall damming my stream. And when the falling leaves stir my jeans, I pace my cell or flop on my bunk and stare at 47 black faces across the space. I am all of them, they are all of me. I am me, they are thee, and I have no children to float the space in between. And I'm just gonna read you a poem about a different American experience um, growing up with someone who's been through uh, combat. You guys have probably all heard of PTSD. You know what it is. Um, but we didn't know what it was in the 50s and the early 60s. I imagine my father tries his mem hand at memoir again. I'm imagining my father sitting down to write his memoir how he would face the blank page, the crowd of sounds and images competing to be the first note of what swirls inside him, the creak of the horse-drawn carriage on Hyde Park Avenue, from which corner after corner he threw bundles of papers to the Sunday newsboys, or the roar of the paper mill on second shift, still in his head while he slept, or the tat-tat-tat of bullets ripping the water around him, as he waded toward the beach in Tarawa, browning high over his head, his partner Jake, ankle deep ahead, crates of shoulders, uh, crates of rounds shouldered, when the unhearable shot slams into Jake's chest and my father must rescue the ammunition. The shallow breath of his wife in her first labor, the little box he holds in his lap two years later, the jokes he tells in tough times, all swallowed by the small, neat hole dug for his, his daughter, filled with moonlight beside her grandfather's grave. His screams filling the frowsy cups of mauve tea roses on the wallpaper of their bedroom, that final go-round with malaria. Kids sent out to play while his wife calls his name, trying to convince him this is not Peleliu or Guadalcanal. You're not in the hospital in Brisbane. The crack of a stick on the jungle floor that flies out of the pot as my mother snaps dry pasta into boiling water. His father's roar as he attempts the steps to the second floor and tumbles backwards calling, Maud, Maudie, get down here and help me, damn you thwack of the stickball bat against the fence or the belt against his legs, another night, another rage. Frankie's sass at supper, the sound of his chair shoved back so fast it flips on the brick pattern linoleum, and Frankie's hanging by his ankles from our father's hands, the silence spreading inside us as our father bellows, you will not talk back. Frankie flying up and down like a pump's handle, our mother calling, Lester, Lester, but not touching him, not grabbing her son from her father's, his father's grasp. I imagine the blank paper an enemy, the way his hold on the now 
might fly apart if just once the words were brought to ink, the genie pushed out of the bottle, the bottle so crammed with the unsaid, the genie is almost not breathing, almost dead, in my father's unconscious thought that it must not be allowed to live. It's my father's hundredth birthday, and I'm still looking, still convinced there was more to know than this. So I give him this day, the electric green of the fields after rain, where deer graze at dusk, their fawns hidden in the uncut hay. I give days of chilly sun and rolling cumulus, Venus fading in the morning blue, the chuckle of wood ducks in vernal pools, the first whippoorwills calling in spring dark. I give him the sorrow of homes, because now he can take it and maybe even weep, and the sweetness of his great-grandkids, their blooming chortles and silly laughs, born late enough to know him only as we share him. I give the poems I keep writing like rough maps of the world, berms of language I have made to protect me for a moment at a time from the violence of being human words to root what love is, hardy, green, and tender as April's grass. Thank you so much, Miriam. We appreciate that. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Laurel Kornheiser. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from the students who are participating today at the Plymouth County Correctional Facility. And uh, their task was to write a poem uh, about American experience or a, in their American voice. I do have a couple of students as well who are carrying poems from a couple of the inmates who shared their poems uh, with us today. Um, and so without further ado, I will First, ask if there's a volunteer who would like to go first uh, to read today before I just select someone. Um, Tatiana, you were. <laughs> come on, you can come up. Okay, so they, she's going to read a poem of her own, and she does have one as well that was written by another student who can't be here this afternoon. So, without further ado, Tatiana, if you have. So this one is by a classmate, um, Brooke. My perception of America is unique. No one sees it the way I do. There are endless opportunities to change your life, but those can be positive and negative. Pressure to conform to social norms often leads to unhappiness. Many of these standards are unattainable. School, college, job, marriage, kids, not everyone wants the same thing. Body image, social media, brand names, these are all symbols of success in the public eye, when all that really matters to me is achieving my goals and finding happiness. Happiness means something different to everyone, but we all know the feeling when we find it. The path to getting there is, not sure what that says, but America is a place to make your own path in life. That's one. Um, and then this one is mine. Um, it's called Land of Liberty. Free and beautiful it is to be, living here in the arms of liberty. I know a day when this wasn't so. Oh, how happy to be taken here. At six years old, I came across the seas and celebrated my newfound ease. Immigration was welcome here. Opportunity started to come near. Oh, how happy to be taken here. The abundance of food took me by surprise. Was this for real? Where was I now? Education was a thing when all I'd known was idle sitting. Reading, writing, arithmetic, these new things were puzzling. Goodbye, I waved to unfortunate playmates. Out the door I flew without a second thought. The orphanage was no place for me. Away I went with much to be taught, hurrying away to the land of liberty. I, we appreciated that very uplifting poem because a lot of the poems were not quite as uh, 
as positive as that one, so it's really, really nice. I also forgot to say that I would like with the students when they come up, if you want to also share a word or two about your experience today um, at the uh, facility, that would be helpful at all if, if you care to do that. Um, Connor, would you like, Connor is going to be reading a poem from one of the participants at the correctional facility. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be reading a uh, poem written by an inmate named Josh. It's, uh, it's titled, No Gray There. It's the little things that kill, like razor blades in a suitcase. Watching Seinfeld, Seinfeld every week and never knowing how the soup tastes. Against machines like guerrilla radios, in chains like Alice, but free as a bird. Where dudes go to church to fight and pass kites, but never listen to God's word. Where white kids can act black, but black will never be white, and there's no gray there. Paint peeling off the tables we eat from, but your floor is clean enough to eat off of. Am I wrong? For being mad at the environment that produced me, or mad at myself for producing an environment I don't want, my, I don't want to raise my children in. Why do we incubate our downfall and shortcomings? Not afraid to die, but afraid to be alone. Finding comfort in desolation and hate. When you expect to fail, you will. You cannot commit to a win when you're sworn to a loss. I've never seen things so clearly, feeling the painfulness of the truth, that the ones I love most are the ones I hurt worse. I want to live in people's hearts, not their memories, and there's no gray there. And uh, just a few words about the whole program. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. Definitely uh, really eye-opening. That was my first time visiting in any sort of jail or anything. And uh, I'd honestly love to go back. The, uh, the inmates were all great guys, super nice, great personalities, senses of humor. And above all, they were amazing writers. So. And Joshua, who wrote that poem, uh, is actually a very prolific poet. He shared three poems with us today. Um, and a couple of them were that was an amazing poem, and a couple of them were extremely touching. Uh, a couple of students had said that his poems brought them to tears because they were so effective. Uh, so do I have a volunteer that would like to go next? Oh, great. MJ, Mary Jane Quinn. So I didn't get to go to the jail today, but um, I did bring in one of my own poems. Um, I didn't title it, so I'm just going to go right into it. Roses were red, violets were blue. All I wanted was to be good enough for you. I wanted a mom, a dad, siblings, maybe a few, just to realize I was undeserving of that too. Be strong like a bull, smart as a whip. Be kind, but also don't take no lip. All these qualities would give me a home. I was wrong, though, <clears throat> and ended up alone. Be pretty, be thin, you'll fit in. However, I was tossed aside in the misfit bin. It's been a long road carrying this load, be this, be that, and I was, yet I always lack. Too plain to be pretty, too dumb to be smart, not good enough to love or be some, in someone's heart. They say it's not easy living in life, they don't tell you it's always a fight. So you'll give up slowly your dreams of a home, you'll give up hope of a love of your own. You give up thinking you can be any more, and you start to think, what am I here for? Life gets dark, you become cold. It's a horrible cycle, so I've been told. Being the reject can make, can make anyone cruel, but being kind still gives me fuel. When the world wants to tell you how you don't amount, I'll stand by your side, on that you can count. When your world starts to crumble, your life starts to fumble, or you can't get back up after that tumble, I'll stand by to help you sort out that jumble. When you feel unloved or immensely hated, I'll love you forever and won't need to be baited. There's no hope for me from what I can see, but maybe all of you is the hope that I need. Okay, 
Gretchen, would you like to come up and share? Gretchen is going to, Gretchen Hamlin has participated in this twice. And so she's going to read one of her own poems and a poem by one of the inmates, David Coleman. I'm going to start with mine. Mine is kind of short and sweet. Um, it's called The American Nightmare. A flood of witless masses does ebb and flow without restriction, lacking independence fed by borrowed causes and convictions. Stifled are the voices that fight to rise above the crowd, because on deaf ears logic falls and common ground is never found. Hatred marches on under false flags of freedom, and the downtrodden dreamers have once again been beaten. Love for thy neighbor has all but disappeared, and those once well-wishers are the ones who you should fear. The mob mentality prevails in this home of the brave because America has forgotten how human beings should behave. Thank you. This is the one that was written by David. It is called The Color Line. And I feel like I should mention that he wrote it on February 28th, which was the last day of Black History Month. It starts exactly four centuries ago. 1619 she arrived, by way of wind-pushed sails, Dutch flag drooping at her stern as she rode the waves of a high tide in from the sea. She ported at an English settlement, Jamestown, in the colony of Virginia. Her, oh, her cargo, as precious as diamonds mined in Sierra Leone, was traded for some form of currency or another battered into being the very first North American slaves. That precise time represents the greatness of what W.E.B. Du Bois dubbed the color line. Strong men forced to do the work of the weak, later brainwashed by the biblical verse stating how the earth shall be inherited by the meek. Physically superior, manipulated into a role of servitude because they were intellectually inferior enraged by their own ineptitude and lack of agricultural skill. They used enslavement, labor without payment, to ensure that their soil be tilled. Black slaves were a blessing, especially the prepubescent, because they'd work them for life. Slave masters loved to drink the jungle juice and reproduce this breed of youth, so they'd rape all the wives, red-hot iron brand, shipped to a foreign land. Placated by inequality, less than what they call a man. Memories of family faces that were never seen again. Mothers lost sons, daughters were ripped from their father's hands. We mounted strong revolts, lost, but never lost our hope. Created Negro spirituals, had to, since those songs to cope, or had to sing those songs to cope. Freedom is what we needed. Still, bondage had a stronger hold. For slaves that were a nuisance, they tied nooses with their strongest rope. In school, they put Nat Turner on the back burner. They'd much rather Boston Massacre, Christmas Attics. They had to use a sword to chop down John Brown. And if you don't know who that is, I'm not mad at you. January 1st, 1863, Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Slaves were free. Call it freedom. Because if you think I'm free, you're dumb to some degree. My last name came from a slave master, but I'm free? Isn't it a damn shame how as soon as that plan changed, the KKK, the KKK clan came. Pastors, lawyers, doctors, even coppers would plan raids. Papia then covered the bullet wound up with a Band-Aid. They burned houses, they burned crosses. In Birmingham, they burned a church. In it, four young girls died. Things seemed to be getting worse. Segregation ended, but was integration a gift or a curse? Integrated schools were dangerous. Children were getting hurt. Considered strong enough to be drafted to fight. Muhammad all refused. He had domestic battles to fight. Why quarrel with the Viet Cong if I can't ask for my rights? Then they took the championship belt. We all know that wasn't right. 
One militant, one nonviolent, two legends gone. They killed Malcolm, they killed Martin, that set it off. Riots in the inner cities, cops turned German shepherds loose. Morality diminished. Black folk felt like we had been less, like we had less to lose. Enter Huey, Bobby, and the whole Black Panther Party. Men and women with afros, black leathers, and shoddies. All power to the people, let's revolt and be free. To counteract the brutality, they policed the police. They gave out jackets and shoes, breakfast for kids. Then they lost little Bobby Hutton, Fred, George, and Jonathan too. Asada exiled to Cuba, a Fenny gave us Tupac. The Panthers split, then came the Crips, and all progress was stopped. The gangs all over the nation murder with no provocation. The situation is amplified when crack enters the equation. Selling their bodies for drugs, that's what it did to our women. Premature birth with a habit, that's what it did to our children. The war on drugs was revamped and we took a hit from the system. Next thing you know, there's less black men in college than in these prisons. Damn, Rodney King took a beating from LAPD. 2008, Obama became commander in chief. Oscar Grant, Sean Bell, Gatlin's cousin D. That's only three examples of black men killed by police. This nation's too divided. We need a resolution. Shout out Opal Medi, Black Lives Matter, the movement. Freedom is still elusive. That's not a mystery. In school, they teach you his story. This is black history. Thank you. That's just a sample of some of the great poetry that we heard today in, uh, in the correctional facility. So that's fantastic, thank you. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to come up next? So Nicholas is another uh, student who's participated in this program, I think uh, three times maybe? Four times. Um, so four out of the six times that we've done it. So fantastic. He's got a poem to share with us today. The title of my poem is called The Dream. From early childhood, I had this dream, but little did I know it was not quite what it seemed. A fairy tale dream where your family lives happily ever after is now a bitter divorce of disaster. Our once white picket fence home is now in jeopardy since dad did not pay back the loan. Foreclosure is slowly creeping around the corner. I hear the gossip of hate and slander Pulling alone with nowhere to hide, my mood has slowly changed from Jekyll to Hyde. So much chaos, how do I cope? So lay I watch some of my friends dying from dope. Now in D-E-T-O-X I sit, just here with a pen and my wit. Thirty days clean, trying to get my life back together by making the green. Going back to school, determined to get my degree and once again, make this a better dream. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Kornheiser for taking me to jail again. It was really an eye-opening experience. Every time I go there, I get goosebumps on my spine. The hairs on my back just stand up. and It's just a really educational experience. And just you see what other people's experiences are in the American voice. Some of us have had hardships in our lives that make us who we are and stronger today, and then some of us may have had an easy streak, but there's always brighter light at the end of the tunnel. Emma, would you like to come up next and read, uh, hopefully, your own poem, but as well the poem. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you don't have to. But you are going to read one of the poems that we read. We uh, had five poems that we read with the inmates today. We only got around to talking about two of them because our discussion just kind of took off like fireworks. But uh, Emma's going to read one of the poems that we talked about. Thank you. Um, this is my second time going to the um, prison, and I really enjoy it. And thank you, Dr. Kornheiser, for inviting me again. Um, my poem does not feel complete, so I'm just going to read uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's poem, I Am Waiting. <clears throat> 
I am waiting for my case to come up, and I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder, and I am waiting for someone to really discover America and whale, and I am waiting for the discovery of a new symbolic Western frontier, and I am waiting for the American eagle to really spread its wings and straighten up and fly right, and I am waiting for the age of anxiety to drop dead, and I am waiting for the war to be fought which will make the world safe for anarchy. And I am waiting for the final withering away of all governments. And I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the second coming. And I am waiting for a religious revival to sweep through the state of Arizona. And I am waiting for the grapes of wrath to be stored. And I am waiting for them to prove that God is really American. And I am waiting to see God on television, piped onto church altars, if only they can find the right channel to tune in on. And I am waiting for the Last Supper to be served again with a strange new appetizer. And I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for my number to be called, and I am waiting for the Salva Salvation Army to take over. And I am waiting for the meek to be blessed and inherit the earth without taxes, and I am waiting for forests and animals to reclaim the earth as theirs. And I am waiting for a way to be devised to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. And I am waiting for lynettes and planets to fall like rain, and I am waiting for lovers and weepers to lie down together again in a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the great divide to be crossed and I am anxiously waiting for the secret of eternal life to be discovered by an obscure general practitioner. And I am waiting for the storms of life to be over. And I am waiting to set sail for happiness. And I am waiting for a reconstructed Mayflower to reach America with its picture stories and TV rights sold in advance to the natives. And I am waiting for the lost music to sound again in the lost continent in a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the day that maketh all things clear, and I am awaiting retribution for what America did to Tom Sawyer, and I am waiting for Alice in Wonderland to retransmit to me her total dream of innocence, and I am waiting for Child Roland to come to the final darkest tower, and I am waiting for Aphrodite to grow live arms at a final disarmament conference and a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for some intimations of more immortality by recollecting my early childhood and I am waiting for the green mornings to come back again. You dumb green fields come back again. And I am waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shake my typewriter and I am waiting to write the great indelible poem and I am waiting for the last long careless rapture and I am perpetually waiting for the fleeing lovers on the Grecian urn to catch each other up at last and embrace. And I am awaiting perpetually and forever a renaissance of wonder. Okay, we're going to hear from another student poet. This is Mackenzie. Okay, so mine's called America's Not the Same. America the Free. America the brave, where a flag flies high for all the men who gave their lives for their land, for you and for me. America the good, America the beautiful, a land full of blue skies that never dull, rolling hills and mountaintops, from sea to magnificent sea. But the land of what we call the free is not what our founding fathers envisioned it to be. The friends of color know the taste of hate, from sea to shining sea, filled with rubbish that kill the creatures we claim to save. Rolling hills scorn black from flames. Snowy mountains turn to mountains of waste. And it's sad to know that we the people are the blame. And America's not the same. Okay, some of the poems that we heard today, um, both in the prison and in class, uh, are of a personal nature. And you know, show sort of different aspects of the American experience. We, we tend to fixate on American dreams, um, American opportunities, or the lack of those. 
But then there are real people that are in their everyday struggles that are part of the American fabric, really. And we're going to hear a really touching poem from Jennifer right now that is on that line. So. Um, my poem is called Hope. I could stop and stare at you all night. I can write the saddest lines tonight. I loved him, he loved me too. On nights like these, I held him tight in my arms. To, I'm sorry. On nights like these, I held him in my arms so tight. I kissed him under the infinite sky. Sometimes I feel leaving this will be easier than living it. We used to live life. Now you're just too sick, too ill, too weak. I pray to God every day a miracle will come your way. The doctors say you will be fine eventually. When will that eventually ever come? It breaks my heart to see you so sick. I want to hold you in my arms, kiss you under the infinite sky. Just a reminder, don't be shy about talking about your experience. Uh, at the <laughs> just want to hear, so, especially the people that weren't there, just so they kind of know what the experience is all about and they can kind of get a sense of why it's so important that we keep doing this. Um, but next up is Olivia Lane, who uh, is going to share her original poem today. Mine's called There Is a Time. There was a time when America was born, then the women and men became torn. Even though the past was rough, what will the future have in store? It's a little less tough. There was a time when the men went to work and the women stayed home, cooking and cleaning. They did the chores, watched the kids, no chance of a future, only clothes to sew. There was a time when men could only vote. Women did not have a say, they did not have a voice. Only men could have a say on our country. Over 100 years later, women had a choice. There was a time when the men went to war. The women built planes, built trucks, ship supplies, helped them win the war. Without the women, would they have as much luck? There was a time when the war was finally over. Men went to work, women forced to stay home. Slowly, some women became nurses and teachers. Now it's time for a different tone. Now is a time where women have careers. There's no more crying, no more tears. Hopefully one day we'll have equal pay, and maybe one day every kid will have a say. There was a time when women, there was a time America was born. We come, have come a long way, some still have to pay. There was, that was the beginning, this is the now. When will we all become equal somehow? Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivia. She's reminding us of the women's part of the history, right? Um, so next up is going to be George Pike, who also has an original poem to share with us today. Uh, thank you. As um, uh, Professor uh, said, uh, you know, we were given the assignment of um, you know American voices um, and so um, experiences. So and so, I would like to share my experience. Uh, writing this poem the day before and um, reading it out to a bunch of prisoners and now reading it out on camera. Um, and so my literary career is really taking off, but that doesn't, none of this really compares to the, the passion and dedication that these inmates uh, you know, shared with us. And I think that's really um, a key takeaway that I had personally. Um, anyway, this is untitled. You've come so far, land of the free, where I can buy a house and own a car. I can use Facebook and be seen. I can collect debt and live large and pretend I'm in charge. I can have Netflix and watch TV, but I cannot buy anything that will fulfill me. Applebee's and Mickey D's seem to only tease a greater hunger than they can ever appease. The latest smartphone with 4K and an Xbox with Blu-ray. Material treasure which can only betray the inner desire I have inlaid. The hordes we collect for status, which only make us the fattest. A room full of toys providing little more than a feeble joy. And to want more may be a desperate ploy. To find a purpose in inner fire. And to look for a way out of an inescapable quagmire. So I take my toys and maintain my poise. 
I waste my breath, and I distract myself while I wait for death. any students? Did every, does anybody else have a poem that they wanted to? So I would like to thank all of our student poets and thank you very much Miriam. Thank you of course Jennifer for always doing a fabulous job pulling all of this together every single time. Thank you to Will who does such a fabulous job getting all the inmates fired up about this literature and getting them so well prepared. Um, it takes a lot of bravery to write poetry, to share poetry, it takes a lot of bravery sometimes to go into a prison among people that you think are going to be very different from you and find out that actually uh, we all share in this human experience and that literature in particular brings us together in ways that you can't imagine uh, until you're sitting in a room with people from all backgrounds and they all find something common to talk about. So thank you all very much for sharing. Thank you to all the students. and. Uh, Till the next time. And there's a few refreshments back, so help yourself.